Hey there. If you haven't run across me on YouTube, somebody's been watching out for you thus far. Today's your unlucky day. But I am Ken. I am Paul Miro, Junk Pile Guitars. I am known to build guitars out of just about anything. And um, if you care to subscribe to my YouTube channel, you go ahead and do that because you will see some really practical, easy uh, ways to fix up guitars, build guitars, do repairs with kind of common tools and not get a lot of money into it. So, today I am here to talk to you about kit guitars and if you're thinking about building a kit guitar some of the things that might you might consider before you do now I'm going to take you down a path of arch tops and uh, I want to show you this one to kind of give you a flavor of what kind of thing I do I'm about to put this one in a box and send it out to somebody that's a very accomplished blues guitar player um, uses a percussive style, I mean, you got a lot of beating on things and whatever he does. But this is a 1962 Harmony H1213 guitar. When I got this, the finish was off, it was cracked, the body was bowed up really bad and fluted right up my alley. Now, if you ever watch one of the videos or video series or playlists, I'll give you the one on this guitar called Pumpkin. Again, its body was fluted like a pumpkin. And everything was wrong with it. You watch that playlist, you can kind of get an idea of how easy it is to sink a lot of money and time into a guitar that wasn't that great to begin with when it came out. It was a catalog guitar. And... Um, at the end of it, you might find out that you paid $400 for a guitar that needs a $500 neck reset. So, my guitars go out to players, blues players, and my guitars have to be dependable. So you'll find that I put pieces, build things up, and uh, kind of get out in the weeds. And you want to remember the risk of doing that is that you may end up with something that will not take the modifications and will not stand up to everyday life on the road. And that is kind of where I went down the road of arch top guitars. I love arch top guitars and guitars that have the F holes in them. And today I'm going to guide you through how to pick a kit if this type of guitar, this style of guitar appeals to you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about history of the arch top, where it showed up, and I'm talking about these big, thick, big, uh, hollow body arch top guitars. Well, let's start off in the early 1830s. Martin was building guitars then, and those guitar shapes were kind of this, what we call a Spanish style guitar shape. It's not like a lute, it has a waist. Um, and this is what we knew guitars to be. So I want to show you a couple of guitars real quickly in a little clip here that shows you what guitars look like. There's actually one of the guitars in this case is from 1834. Let's have a look at that. All right, amazing, huh? You notice that one has a kind of like a, a bass or a cello violin looking headstock. Of course, it doesn't have F holes. That will come later with the arch tops. But you notice that the size of guitars back then was relatively small. They were called parlor guitars. And that says a lot about their use. They were not loud instruments. They were resonant, but they weren't good at projecting. So the venue you would play would probably be a small area like a parlor. And again, they were relatively small. Now I want you to remember that there have been orchestras and violins and those types of instruments. Again, orchestras where you've got a 
different numbers of the same type of instruments to magnify volume, especially in a bigger venue like an auditorium. So this idea that you would have an arched body for added resonance is not an old idea. It was just new to guitars about the turn of the century, and we're talking about 1900. You had Orville Gibson running around doing designs, and I want to show you something really cool here. This is a 1918 Model L, L4 Gibson. Now, it is kind of like the Spanish style guitar. It's much bigger. By the way, this is the biggest Spanish style guitar outside of the harp guitar that Gibson had in the catalog. In 1918 but it is an arch top and if you look at it the top and bottom are arched it's got a round sound hole and the way these were made was somebody was taking a solid piece of wood or two bookending the the pieces of wood together and then actually taking a thicker piece of wood and carving it. And the average wage in uh, 1918 was 56 cents an hour. And so your paycheck for the week might look like $25 and $100 a month. And these guitars back then were going for $150. So the average person working on these guitars would not be able to afford one, but this, is an arch top and this is where the idea come now Lloyd Lore came along to Gibson he was gone by 1924 and he introduced the F holes that you see on this cello here into the arch top guitar now they still made some of these with the round and oval sound holes but they fell out of favor because this was a new thing and I tell you that I think that the whole thing about this this F hole business was that people related the look of a violin, cello, or stand up bass to culture, class, and being wealthy. Fortunate for us that, like the blues, when these guitars fell out of favor, they would fall into the hands and become affordable to, to people who are playing the blues, like the kind of music I like. So, these are great instruments. You're going to see this one show up in repair and restoration in my shop. Okay, so I want you to think about when the arch top came out, they're more resonant because they have an arched body and the round sound holes. But when the F holes came out, there are people that will tell you the F holes actually disrupted the uh, function of the of the soundboard or how the top of the guitar vibrates and we could go into that all day long ken parker has a video up about that up there if you want to hear it. you'll learn a lot more history but remember there's two things going on here there's venue in other words where is the guitar effective is it loud enough to amplify to uh say the audience of an orchestra answer no until amplification came along and and so you would have people kind of appearing in an orchestra and it was more of a novelty because you couldn't hear the guitar above everything else charlie christian was the first notable person who was showing up in the benny goodman uh orchestra and sextet and uh and that kind of thing but until 1930 you didn't have any amplification. There was a person named Gage Brewer who went to a company that was called Ropatan, Ropatan, which became Rickenbacker. And in 1930, Gage Brewer went out and bought some instruments, one being a Spanish style guitar that has some kind of pickup put in it. Ultimately, that sold at an estate sale for $5 later on down the road. So by 1936, uh, the amplifiers and pickups were becoming far more efficient. And that took a turn for the archtop guitar as we know with the F holes in it. Because 
the louder the amplification, the more there was something called feedback. And that's what happens when you put an arch top in a stand and leave the amp on. Pretty soon it starts going and starts vibrating. Now, there's a song that was put out by the Beatles, the very first part of the song, and I'm gonna give it to you up, up there. The song is called I Feel Fine, and it starts off with feedback coming out of an arch top guitar. But anyway, at that point, the use of the big body arch top guitar in an orchestra started to turn pretty bad because of feedback issues, polarity issues in the, in the pickups, etc., etc. So the big body arch top started to be used for finesse playing, and that's where you saw people coming in like Wes Montgomery, Kenny Burrell, jazz style players. Okay, so by the time the 1940s come around, especially in the 50s, when especially amplifiers were getting more and more powerful, the full thick, full hollow body arch top guitar was starting to lose its effectiveness in a big uh, venue with big amplification. So the road split and um, there were two ways to retain that classic style arch top look and still be able to play and do whatever you do. And the first one, which some people still do, and I don't recommend, is the Troy Murrah of restaurant method, and that's to tape up the F holes so they don't feed back. Um, I love this guitar, by the way. Uh, you'll find it on my channel here and there. The other means of controlling feedback was to make the guitar thinner and stiffer, you end up with semi hollow body. Okay, you see that? Yeah. So, you, believe it or not, are gonna run across the same dilemma if you are gonna get into the world of arch tops. So, those, <laughs> that dilemma is, are you going to make guitars for an intimate venue where you've got a small, fairly quiet place and you've got someone who has a, a finesse playing style, like these little groups, somebody playing uh, an arch top, you'll have somebody uh, playing drums lightly and maybe a piano or a, a, or a wind instrument or something like that. So know that if you're gonna order and get into big, thick body guitars. When you start talking about amplification, like Ted Nugent, it looks like he is playing a Gibson ES-175 when it's actually a Birdland, but it gives you that look that some people want. Now, let's talk about the next decision you're gonna make. You've seen this one before, it's called a Rex. It's just a brand name. It was put out by Harmony who made hundreds of guitars a day in 1942. And if you look close at this guitar, everything is wrong with it. It's got numerous cracks on the back, on the front. It has tone bars that run inside bracing that only runs this way. And inevitably what happens is those pop loose and shrink the top sucks down and collapses. The top of this is collapsed. I want you to notice that the body is loose from the top and bottom. And when that's happening, it's meaning that the head block inside the big piece of wood and or the one down here are folding up. And when those fold up, it causes the neck like an old man leaning over right here, anything that's got a waist in a Spanish style guitar it folds up and the action becomes very high. You see how those strings are. Somebody's already worked the bridge down, but you can see that that is all wavy and collapsed. So, to fix this guitar, I gotta pull the back off, I've gotta stabilize it, and I basically have to pull the body 
here and here closer and winch it into shape, cut the back, fix the top, build supports and all those kinds of things. And I do that, but in the end, the value of the guitar diminishes when you do stuff like that to it. And face it, a Rex was not the best guitar on the market. It just looked like a Gibson back then, but it certainly wasn't one. So let's say you don't want to go through this, or let's say you want to get into this type of repair work, because there's a lot of these around. There's nothing wrong with fixing them up, especially if you're going to customize them. I tell people, don't take a pristine instrument and decide, oh, I'm just going to start doing whatever I do, because I do some crazy stuff with guitars. Here's one I'm working on now. It's got an oil gauge, it'll have a license plate, matchbooks, coins, whatever. So, if you decide that we're going to go down the pathway of a kit, know that if you pick the right kit, it's going to be pretty solid. A lot of the work, the basic work, the main structural stuff is there, it's solid. You don't have to worry about it breaking. You don't have to put a lot of time and effort into something that wasn't that great to begin with. Now, let's take a couple kits that I have in stock and we'll have a look at them and chase down when you're when you're talking about making something that has this classic F hole shallow base look. Which which kit do you pick? based on your venue and, and the type of player that's going to play it. Uh, before we look at those kits, I want to tell you this too. If you have a finesse player, you are never going to get one of these, even the first day it come out. It was not something that Charlie Christian, Kenny Burrell, or Wes Montgomery would have preferred much. They were more student instruments, Christmas presents to get people off the ground. So when you're thinking about a kit, you also want to think about the finesse level of the artist and what's going to make them happy. So let's roll out the bench and have a look at a couple of kits you might want to consider if you are going to do the classic arch top style. Okay, let's take a look at our first kit. Um, notice the name on the box here. I have worked with this brand and built numerous guitars that have gone out to artists and are played constantly and I have yet to have one fail. So remember that. Remember there are a lot of different kit manufacturers and I think everybody has figured out there's a place or two in the world where there is a great effort given to factories that do nothing but produce guitars. I will tell you this before we open this. Do not use a kit to represent that it is something that you're trying to fool somebody into thinking it's this name or any of the other big names. Don't do that. A kit is an opportunity for you to learn, put something together, enjoy building it. But if you think you're going to race out into the kit world and produce instruments to fool people, no one will be fooled. So that said, let's open this one up and see what we have inside. Remember, keep some of the attributes I've told you about the other guitars when you see this one. So, first thing I want to tell you is we have all of the hardware pickups, pit guard, trapeze, everything that you need to build this guitar comes with it. Can you use other parts? Of course you can. You can always upgrade parts and individualize things, but again, the framework is going to be solid. Now, I've told you that you might have to take the neck off of uh, something like this and reset it, or even some of the better instruments, the neck, especially those that have no truss rod, is going to need some work after 60, 70, 80. I've worked on guitars that are approaching 100 years old. But let's take a closer look at this one. And try to keep that box up there. This is a thick body, 
hollow body arch top guitar. Now, you see this cutaway here? The guitars that I've showed you before do not have cutaways. Some of the older ones end at the 12th fret at the body. Uh, but this is meant to be able as a, as a player to get down into the lower frets, the higher notes. And if you're going to get a guitar like this, they have right and left handed ones. You want to make sure you know what that is. Now, this front here is spalted maple. I am a tree guy, an arborist by trade. And what this is, is trees compartmentalize decay. In other words, they respond to what's going on inside things like pests, uh, pathogens that attack their vascular system, or whatever. But this is a rare wood. Uh, it comes at a premium price. The kit took two pieces and bookended them together and that is a good piece of wood. The binding is already there. All the holes are drilled and everything is pretty clean. Even the F holes have binding around them. Now, here's where some people run into a problem right away is setting the neck in because sometimes kits that are made with let's say high tolerances, meaning we just throw things together, the neck fits in sloppy, it's not right. And while we're holding this up, this neck has a truss rod. There is not a shape on the, the form of the headstock that's gonna get you in copyright trouble right away. Everything is clean, it's well sanded. Um, you're gonna use some um, clean up and, and light sanding, for example, where the truss rod, this thing has a truss rod where you can adjust the relief on the neck, but when they lubricate those, um, sometimes some of that lubricant gets out here. There's ways to, to fix that. It comes with a knot. Now, as I run my fingers up and down the frets, notice that the frets have binding, that's a sign of, of, of a better guitar. And sometimes sloppy fret jobs, you have stuff sticking out. There's a little bit of work to do on these frets, but again, it's winter time here. Um, things swell and contract based on the weather. The neck, where this goes into the pocket, well, let's have a look. One of these is done with a lot of sloth will not fit in. This is tapered if you look at it. And the neck pocket on the guitar is tapered as well. So that means instead of sliding it in or doing this, you get right over the top and slide it down. And this is a tight fit already. So there's gonna be a little bit of work to do there, a little bit of sanding on the neck, but this thing is ready to pop right in. You can see that there is a bevel cut there. And so the neck angle on this thing is good. And it's got a nice fingerboard. It has nice fret markers. And this is ready to go. Now, what would I use this for? Well, my experience tells me that if you have people that are sitting, again, in a venue that's not huge, some stadium or amp, you got stacks of marshals. This is not a KISS concert guitar. This is something that someone will play and do finesse playing on it. So putting this together and getting it just right and doing the setup, getting a good kit that has most of the stuff in order means that there's gonna be a lot less finesse work for you to do, especially if it's your first kit. So you'll get something that's got good wood, ready to go together, hardware with it, and then you can invest your time and effort into learning how to do the setup and get everything just right. So again, this one is bound to give you a lot of feedback when amplified highly. So let's look at another kit if you want a general use that's not so much prone to feedback. All right, this kit, as you can see, is from the same 
manufacturer guitar kit world um, and it actually is going to help me solve a problem several of my kit derived uh, arch top guitars have gone out to blues players and there's the limiting factor of if they're doing uh, a smaller venue they love the guitar but again go to a stage festival blues festival those kinds of things where the amp Amplification gets bigger just to get up over the noise of the crowd and the feedback is sometimes a problem so I can get the same look but better function for that venue and that application by going with something like this this one I like guitars that have a cutaway the last one you seen was called a Florentine cutaway um, that that horn looking and then there's a Venetian cutaway that's more rounded. Again, we see this kit comes with all the parts you would need. Unlike the last one, which was silver and black, this one is gold and black. It has gold trimmed everything, tuners, um, pickups, all the parts are coming a, a gold color. Now, as we look at this neck, let's start with the neck there is a truss rod so you can adjust the relief um, the whole thing is bound see there's binding again the headstock is not of a proprietary design that's going to get you in trouble everything is sanded pretty well again there's going to be some work to do on uh, the finish because you're going to need to make sure that there's no oils from either your fingers or anything else on here um, the nut is there everything is bound like a great more pricey guitar again the fret work even with the binding on feels pretty good there's some seasonal up and down that comes with that everything on the neck pocket looks good and um, great quality okay now looking at the body this is where the big difference is The body is much thinner. You can see that. So let's take a look at one of those other arch tops. And you can tell much, much thinner. But like the thicker body with the Florentine cutaway, uh, this one has good wood. It's matched. You see that? It's flamed maple. There's not nothing weird here. There's good sanding to begin with. The body. Uh, pocket or the neck goes appears to be good let's get that out of the way right away because sometimes these things are all sloppy and they don't fit in right so we pop that right there with snug okay. you don't want to let this loose but everything is nice and smooth right there a lot of work is done already and if you look at the neck angle it's going to have an elevated bridge and so that looks good let's be careful with that great binding everywhere all around the neck pocket it has purfling which is a couple of black and white alternating strips the sides are great the back looks it looks like a solid piece of wood but all the holes everything the f holes have binding this is ready to go but the main thing about this is this guitar is a semi hollow body it gives you the same look with the f holes it gives you that arched look you see that it is arched even the back is arched but this whole part of the guitar underneath is solid and you've got solid stuff holding this so if you tap around you can hear where it's solid and where it's not so that is going to make the top less vibratory vibrate less whatever words you want to use the feedback goes down and face it the durability of one of these things that's more solid is a lot lot better than something like this that falls apart over the years it still survived a collision with the light above me but yeah so this is the difference 
less vibration, less feedback, more likely to take much higher levels of amplification in a bigger venue. Okay guys, there you go. There's two different kinds of guitars. The full body, complete hollow body arch top and the semi hollow body arched top and back guitar. They both give you that look you want and they give you some options as to how they will function. Now, this kit guitar manufacturer has all kinds of different kits, solid bodies, anything you want. You just look at their site and I'm going to give you a link below. And if you get down in the details in the description below, you're going to find that there's a code down there that if you use that code, you watching this video is going to save you some money on your next or your first kit with Guitar Kit World. Now, everybody's got that question. When my guitar gets done, what is it going to look like? Well, here's one. I customize my guitars, I beat them up, and I make them look like something that has survived the 1950s and every yard sale after that. This is a Venetian cutaway kit guitar. You ready? I'm not sure you're ready for this. I highly customize my guitars. No two of them are the same. Remember, I'm not trying to fool anybody into thinking that this is anything other than one of my junky guitars, but I guarantee you they play really well. So, visit the Guitar Kit World site. See if there's something there that catches your eye. Ask questions and then use that code that's down below. It's Junk Pile. J-U-N-K. P I L E junk pile, and you're going to get a discount on a kit. But let's end this. Anything can look good or bad in this case. Let's see how this sounds as we visit my friend Cody Harrow, who lives in North Mississippi, straight out of Sardis, Mississippi, playing one of my guitars that I built for him. And I just handed it to him, he'd never touched it before. So let's end with that. Thanks for watching. Give me a like and subscribe if you're into arch tops and junk guitars, but give this a thought. It might be a good fit for you. Mm -hmm.